Well, there we go. Let, let me start recording this. Hold on on the other one. Yep. Okay. Ready to go. Three, two, one. Welcome to the Metal Voice. Once again, our honorary returning member, Don Dawkin himself. And of course, my buddy, Giles Lavery, co-hosting the show today. Don, thank you so much for uh, being on the show. Good to um, see you guys again. And last time I saw you, like we just talked about a minute ago, you had to open my the door to my room because my hands were so paralyzed. I couldn't get in my room. <laughs> so thanks. all cool. Or I would have slept in the hallway. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not laughing at, at it, the situation. I'm just the way you kind of told the story. <laughs> that, yeah. That's all, yeah, yeah. I'm not laughing at you. October 27th, Heaven Comes Down on Silver Lining Music, the new Dawkins album. It's been, whoa, boy, 10 years. Hey, Giles? Well, it's yep. been, yeah, it's been 10 years since Broken Bones, or even 11 years, maybe, I think. Almost. But, the only thing I put out since was the Lost Tapes album, just to hold us over. Yeah, I mean, this is, and, and this is, this is a great record. I mean, I, I love all the Dawkins records, and, you know, some of them have had you know some experimental moments which i think is a good thing i love the darker stuff and you know you know not not everything has to sound like under lock and key you know it's it's great when you expand and you know more minor key stuff but this docken album i think anyone who was a fan of the 80s docken is going to be absolutely thrilled with this and there's the plug right there boom Uh, and that's a plug and i and i you know i i don't like to prop myself up I've done records I wasn't proud of, like Shadow Life. I hated that record. And uh, so I wasn't much involved. It was the band decided we're trying to get, you know, change and become Monster Magnet. But yeah, I, people are asking me, I've done so many interviews. And I said, look, it's been 10 years to assess my life. All the tragedies we had, the bass player crushing his arm. My guitar player had to have massive surgery. I got paralyzed from an asshole doctor. And we survived. And, but, you know, I really think that, as you know, if you've had the album, every song is killer on this record. Yeah, absolutely. Everyone. It's, it's just, it's like, it's like a collection of hit singles, but they're all new. Yeah. And they're all kind of different, you know? Yeah. I remember yeah. or Gypsy or Like a Rose. And then you, you know, we all, Doc and we always used to end our records with a big, fast double bass, a burner, right? Yeah, Tooth yeah. and nail till the living end, lightning strikes again. And I end this record with a Sounds one fun. guitar, one guitar, and me singing about my journey from LA to New Mexico, you know, uh, Santa Fe. Great song, yeah, very simple, right. just guitar, just a vocal. I could have made a huge production out of it. And uh, I was talking to my producer, Bill Palmer, one night, and that's how it happened. And I said, talking about my past because he's from Texas and I said, how do you write your whole life in four minutes? <laughs> Can't be done. Yeah, that's tough. But you did it. But I did it. You did it. <laughs> that's a cool song. It reminds me a little bit of uh, something that could have come off the solitary record. Yeah. As well, which would have been. Kind of in that direction. Yeah. I was always proud of solitary. Yeah. Unfortunate that no record company wanted it. Wow. That's a great record. Nobody. They said, guns don't like docking. I said, what does that mean? I am Don Dawkins. It's just ballads. It's just my poetry put to music. Very every every Dokken record to me sounds like Dokken except for Shadow Life, as you say, which yeah. I don't really I don't really you know, I don't want to start a big thing about that record, but I don't I don't really count that as part of the catalog. You know, the logo's different even, you know, like I just I, I love them all. Like I I mean everything everything from like a race of slate right up to broken bones, I thought was amazing. Awesome. I, I mean, think after just, that, yeah. That was the breaking point again on Shadow Life. And that's why historically you always have the Dawkins logo, which I own. And yeah. I said, I'm not putting my logo on Shadow Life because right. this isn't Dawkins. This is you guys trying to experiment. And you can't even tell it's me because the first day I met the producer, Kelly Gray who played in Queens Rec for a few years, first thing he says to me, meets me, goes, well, I just want to say, I was talking to your boys and I don't like your voice. I said, excuse me? You don't like my voice and you're going to produce our record? Well, you need to get the fuck out of here. You know? And so, as you know, on that record, he put things in my voice, filters, and those things are sound like this, or blah, 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 you know? Oh, like puppet on a string kind of. Yeah. Kind of and you know, that's not, it's like this, all these effects that, you know, Manson used to do on his voice. And I'm like, well, that's crazy. 
And I remember George, he like looked so excited. And he said, finally, you know, we're going to not make Don sound like Don because I hate his voice. And I said, well, George, my voice made you famous. So shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, no one, no one needs to worry. This this new record is far, far, far from Shadow Life. This is this is right in line with any of the classic Dokken records that people. Absolutely, Absolutely. I'd say the only uh, rec, one of my favorite records beyond the catalog that we just sold from the eighties. I loved to race the slate with Red Beach and the band. That was a Me great. Too. Record. It is a great record. Yeah, that was a I cool agree. record. It's a great record. It's a great, it. but it's I, kind of like think, the, the gem bought, of the catalog. I, bought, I would say. I bought the Japanese disc. Because like two of the tunes that are on the Japanese version, uh, every bit as good as the best songs that are on the international version, and the I same, agree. the same for Long Way Home. There's like three tunes that should have been on the international version. There should just be a disc that comes out that brings all these Japanese tracks together. Because there's enough of them to make a record. It's always been a problem since we started. They would say because in Japan. You could, if you want to buy a record in Tokyo or something, Osaka, you had to pay like, say, $24. And, or the fans in Japan could buy the import for $17. Yeah. Right. So the, the, men, the mentality was we'll put a bonus tracks on the Japanese versions to encourage the fans to buy the Japanese version. That was the whole point of the bonus tracks because otherwise the fans would go, well, I'll just buy the American version. You know, it's cheaper. Right. So that's why we added the bonus tracks. And I was really upset. Like you said, some of those bonus tracks that you can only buy in the Japanese were really good songs. Like Dancing, yeah. the Irish song. That's a cool Oh, one. I love that song. Very yeah. Irish. Yeah. Yeah, that was cool. cool. Very Thin Lizzy. A little bit Thin yeah, Lizzy. Totally, totally. I love that tune. I always bought the Japanese versions for that reason. You know what I find amazing about this new album is the production. It's so crisp. The guitar tone is so nice. These songs are really playing to your voice. Yeah. And I, th I think there's a little more, I don't know if we'll call it darker element to your voice. You know, you're not singing the high range as you used to, but you're still singing in the pocket, right? You still, you, the, the melodies are still there. You know, there's something great and fresh about this album and the production that you just don't hear with the bands that are coming out with albums today. No, and I agree with you. I think the album sounds fresh and new. And I realized after all these years, after a break from Broken Bone, I said, you know, I don't have anything to prove. You know, there's always the fans in the front row when I'm playing. And if I don't hit that B flat above A and kiss of death, the high scream, and they look at me like and they point like up like, hey, you didn't hit the high note. Well, guess what, guys? <laughs> that was 30, 40 years ago. Right. So I, I, I wrote this record in my comfortable range. And uh, but it still has the dock and harmonies and 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 you'll notice on the record, there's no really songs about love and love lost and love found. That was used to be my kind of go to uh, or sarcastic songs like you just got lucky or it's not love, you know, kind of like saying you got me. But so what? But these all these songs, I think, on Heaven Comes Down are like stories like Gypsy, Fugitive. I remember probably the only one that's kind of a uh, reminiscent. Of, I was thinking about my past and my life and I wrote the song I remember, but they're all still rocking. Yeah, absolutely. And it's great. What you said, I think is really true. It sounds like you're singing in a real comfortable area and range that I, th I think your voice sounds powerful, clear. The harmonies are great. Yeah. And you, you know, you're not, you're not, you're not trying to sing something that you sang in 1986 and failing no. to do it, you're singing right where you're comfortable and it sounds awesome. And I did that for several years on tour and, you know, I wasn't singing well and I wasn't playing well. And and uh, I just said, look, I have nothing to prove and I'm going to sing where it's comfortable. Yeah. So we just tuned down to E flat and I, I know my keys, A, E and D down lower. And John knows me so long now, 20 years being in the band. So he, the songs he wrote, he wrote in my comfort range. So I could just sing and put emotion in the lyrics without trying to sing super high, which I was yeah. struggling, you know, because I'm, which, I'm which is something something I noticed on the last record, too, like a song like Burning Tears. That's so in your range. You sound so comfortable singing it. It's full of emotion. This album has that as well. And Thank I think you. and I think that is every bit as good and as valid as anything that you sang in the 80s. 
Yep. Thank you for that. It's sad a little bit that, you know, we're known for breaking the chains, tooth and nail, unlock and key, back to the attack, unlock and key. But a lot of fans don't know we moved on and did Dysfunctional, one of my favorite albums. Love it. Uh, Long Way Home with John Norum, Eraser Slate with uh, Reb Beach, you know, we, Lightning Strikes Again with John. I wasn't crazy about Hell to Pay. That was my first record I wrote with John. And, you know, John hadn't played in years. You know, he's an attorney and he had left the business and we struggled to find John had to find my way where I wanted to sing. And he kept trying to write songs that sounded like old Dokken. And I said, screw that. Let's just write a song that we like. So hell to pay was so, so, you know, but uh, there were some good songs on it, but. Oh yeah. Bur- Prozac Nation. Burning, Tear- so Burning Tears. Yeah. Burning Tears was cool. But now I'm in my comfortable range, you know. <laughs> uh, I know a lot of bands I've gone to see in the last year that are still very famous. And I noticed as soon as I got to the venue, they're singing all, they're playing all their songs much lower because their singers are in their 70s. But they're using backing tracks too, Don. You know, yeah, I, I mean, that. the Scorpions don't, thank God. Scorpions are still Scorpions. Klaus. Klaus. They've, 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 they've taken it down. I went to see the Scorpions a couple of years ago and they've, they've they taken, have taken it, it down. down. It sounds cool. It sounds it sounds heavy. It's it's got power. It's not like it's a cop out or anything. It sounds no. I I agree. I mean, why torture Klaus? I went to Vegas when they were doing their residency for a month, and I went to like three shows because I love the Scorpions. And Klaus sounded great. He just sings lower. I mean, what do you want from these guys, man? They're in their seventies. You know, come on. (laughs) And and he does sing great even at that lower range. Done. Don, you know, the band, you know, everyone keeps saying, when's the band going to reunite the classic lineup? But I mean, a lot of people don't realize this is how you started. In a sense, you've come full circle, right? You weren't with George Lynch at the beginning. You were on your own as Don Dawkin, correct? Yep. Yep. The and first album was called Don Dawkin. Breaking how many change, years? I- just just quickly summarize for the people out there, you know, you're, you're, you go to Germany. I'm, I'm not sure why you went to Germany. I guess for a recording contract. And from there, you sort of started off as Dokken, correct? Actually, backwards. I had okay. done two tours in Germany as Dokken because New Wave was so popular in L.A. We couldn't get a gig anymore. So I got invited. We did those two little club tours, same ones the Beatles did. You know, the top 10 in Chicago. The Beatles started out in Germany. People don't remember that. And they were playing cover songs five hours a night. But when I met Dieter Dirks and Klaus had had his surgery... And he said, you know, oh, you, you you sing with vibrato like Klaus. I said, yes, not a lot of singers don't use vibrato. I'd love you to come to Germany and just do the high, high, high notes. Yeah. Because basically I was a virgin, right? My voice was fresh. I was in my 20s. And so I, when I sang on that record, Dieter said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll let you go in my B studio with Michael and make a demo. And I made a demo. And actually the manager of... Except Gabby Hauk at the time was there making uh, Rush Restless Road. and Wild. Restless and Wild. Restless and Wild. So she took my demo to Hamburg to Rob Byerlel, who was the president of Career Records, a French label. And she came back. I picked her up. She handed me a plane ticket. That was it. And I went, he wants to give me a record deal? Well, that's awesome. It was 20,000 marks, which broke out to 8,500 U.S. dollars pennies yeah. and he played for the war and he, and he says you got three weeks to make a record here's my problem i don't have a band <laughs> it's just me so that's when i called mick who i'd known the boys and wanted him to come do the drum tracks in germany he was broke the band had broken up and he said why don't you take george too and i said mm, you know i'm a lead guitar player i, I don't really need george oh, he's great i said yes i've seen him george is great so I hired Mick and George to come to Germany and we did break in the chains and that was it. Unfortunately, we were only like mm, two thirds done with the record. I woke up one day and there was a hotel that Dieter owned behind the studio and they left. They went back to America. Didn't say anything. They just left, went back and took, left back to LA. I went, uh, now I'm screwed. The record's not done. So I had well, to finish breaking the chains by myself. So that was kind of, Let's just, let's just say we start out 
on a bad foot. <laughs> but let me ask you this, and this, this is more specific. It's kind of like the Van Halen thing. Like you're using your last name as the band, which probably later on helped and hurt the band, right? And it sort of created that tension. Yes. So, right at, so you say, guys, the band's going to be called Dawkin. What were their first thoughts when you were recording that album? Well, I think they, they didn't care because they thought, you're going to pay us a couple thousand dollars and buy us a plane ticket and we're just going to go play on your record and we'll go back to our other lives and continue yeah. on with their own careers. So, you know, years later, I remember, I can't remember what record it was. George and I were doing like a around the world press. Went to London. We went to Czechoslovakia. We went to oh, Czech, you know, Germany, Paris. And they wanted George to go with me to promote Shadow Life, which an album I hated. And we went to, back to Japan, and I remember one day I said, George, what, what is the problem why we can't get along? And I was standing on the side of the stage and sound check, and he pointed up at the backdrop, said Dokken, and he pointed and he goes, that's the problem. And I went, oh, okay. If we were probably called the dead puppies, there would probably wouldn't have been a problem, right? You know, but he always took umbage umbrage that the fact the band was called Dokken. And I said, George, I can't help that. It's not my fault, you know. But George always wanted to do his own thing. He started Lynch Mob, you know, in 90. And that was a problem. And he finally owned it and said, I don't like being in a band that's named after you. And I said, well, George, that's ego. I'm sorry, that's ego. And that was always the problem, you know, but he, it took him 20 years to admit it. So it is what it is. It's history now. It's been all the internet. You know, George spent plenty of time bashing me in the press for years. And I tried not to respond. I said, look, if you're bitter and you're unhappy, I don't know why anybody in Dawkins was unhappy because we had a very unusual band agreement that all the money would be split, split four ways. So Mick's the lucky guy. <laughs> Mick made millions and he didn't have to write shit. He only had to play drums for a week in the studio and rehearse for a couple of weeks. He made a lot of money. But that was a deal I made, you know? So I didn't understand why the band was felt like I was doing something that wasn't right when we were all making the same amount of money. It was very bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. And the band was doing great. You guys were doing amazing in the eighties. It was uh it's hard it's hard to see why anyone would be unhappy with that. I, I think it's kind of like the David Lee Roth Van Halen thing, right? Like even though David Lee it's kind of like he's pigeonholed. You know, he's got a they, they got a pigeon pigeonhold on him because he can't go out as Van Halen. He can only go out as David Lee Roth. And he did. And he did. And he did. And he did. And, he did. and then he did but, the reunion tour. And I felt so bad for David. I've known him forever. When they did that TV show in Times Square, and here's David, and he's doing his martial arts thing with his oh you know, yeah chucks, and he breaks his nose, he hits his the stick <laughs> hits his nose. Yeah, they they had to breaks tape it. him up. They had to go off and tape him up, and then start the show again. Eddie's <laughs> just like playing solos, going what what the fuck's going on? You know, where's David? And he's off on the side trying to push his nose back together. That was kind of kind of a bad way to start the reunion tour. Another great story is a lot of people don't talk about is how, and again, I don't know how true this is, but when Tooth and Nail was released, it was a slow burner, right? It was, it was a, a slow label. burner. Was the label ready to drop you where management came in and said, no, you're not going to drop these guys. You're going to let them do another record. I mean, how did that go down? Uh, I was really freaked out. You know, when we did Breaking the Chains tour, it was our first arena tour. We were playing with Blue Oyster Cult and Al Nova. And Al Nova had that big hit, you know, life is fantasy. just fantasy. Can't you feel this fantasy life? You know, so we were the opener. We got 35 minutes. But we're playing in front of 10,000 people. So I was really happy. And I thought, and then I would, I swear, every city we went to, everybody, every radio station, when there was still radio, was playing Breaking the Chains. So I thought, we're, we're on our way, you know? And there's a saying 
But after the tour, when they told us we only sold 100,000, I said, mm -hmm. well, how's that possible? We just did a huge tour. How's it possible? And we're on the radio everywhere. I could hear myself in L.A. every half hour on KLOS, KMET, KNAC, Breaking the Chains. And the term the record companies would say it was a passive hit. Everybody loved the song, but nobody bought the record. Turntable hit. Turntable hit, they used to call it, too. Yeah, turntable hits. And we'd done the video, the silly video, me chained up. And, you know, it was our first, you know, time. But I was sold the record company, of course. It wasn't just us on Electric. They wanted to drop Dawkins and I think Motley Crue. They wow. wanted to real smart. Real smart. Thinking there, <laughs> yeah, real smart. Drop, the, drop, drop, the real two big, drop the two biggest bands. Let's do that. Yeah. <laughs> well, they wanted to go. What was happening? They yeah. wanted to hire black R and B singers and new wave bands, and they did. They signed a lot of bands. And the joke was that you know bands like Dawkins and Motley Crue, and you know, we kept that label going. Yeah. You know, and they wanted to drop us. So, yeah. That's why we called the record Tooth and Nail. And actually, the band kind of broke up after that tour. George was going to be joining Ozzy. And uh, he went to London to audition. He was like up to like the number one guy they were going to take. And for some reason, I still don't know. They put him on a plane and sent him home. He didn't get the gig. Jakey Lee got the gig. So here I'm moving forward. I'm playing the whiskey. And I've hired Warren D. Martini who was in Rat, and he and we were showcasing. And I look out in the audience, and there's George standing there. What the hell is he doing here? I thought he's an Aussie. And it was kind of funny. He kind of pulled Warren aside. Warren was 18. And George's like, you don't want to be in Dawkins. You don't want to do this. You know, Don's an asshole. You don't want to do this. Because George wanted his gig back. That's the bottom line. Right. And Rat had just released that EP, you know, and Juan had left the band because he didn't get along with George. And Rat exploded, you know, when they did Round and Round. So that was that. And uh, I had to laugh when I saw George standing in front of the stage at the Whiskey. And he wanted to be back in the band. And I said, well, you can't be like coming and going. And either you commit or you don't commit. So the, the bottom line is, like, I, I titled the record Tooth and Nail, which means it's your last fight. It's your last chance. And the record company between even with my manager, who was Cliff Bernstein, who turned up, he's like the most powerful management company in the world, Q Prime. Yeah. They have Metallica, who can play anywhere they want. They play the Antarctic. They had Tesla. They had Queens, right? They had Smashing Bone. I mean, Cliff is a genius. And I thank Cliff for finding me and calling me and saying, hey, I found this record called Breaking the Chains. It's an import. And I'd like to meet you in LA and talk to you about managing you. And he came out and met me. And I remember saying, well, I'd love you to manage me and help me out. Uh, but we don't have a, I don't have a band. <laughs> I had Mick actually, Mick was my roommate. So, you know, Jeff was playing in club bands. George was trying to do his own thing. And I told him, I don't, I don't have a band. So Cliff said, you should reach out to George and, 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 uh, Juan, you know, and Juan said, no, I don't want to do it. So we got Jeff, found him in a bar. And the rest is history, you know, and and it turned out I, I can't take credit for all the success of Doc. And I swear to God, uh, Cliff Bernstein was a genius. That's probably why every band he ever managed had success. But he had a plan. And every time we got more famous gold records, platinum records, I kept saying, why can't we go out and headline? Nope, you got to wait, got to wait, got to wait. You got to be a support band, you know, got to wait, be patient. And that was very frustrating. And then finally, we got to the Monsters of Rock level. So Dr Cliff had a plan. And then when we broke up, yeah, I think he took that whole docking plan and just switched it over to Metallica. Right. Same producer, Bob Rock, Bruce Fairburn. They actually came to one of our shows. We met him in the hotel room. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, we can get Bob Rock and Bruce Fairburn. This album will be amazing. And my and the three of them didn't want them. And I was not happy. And our management wasn't happy. I said, it's Bob Rock, man. It's Bruce Fairburn. Their body of work speaks for itself. I mean, God bless Bruce Fairburn who's passed away. But Bob Rock was the guy. 
and my band members didn't want to use them. And I thought, this is so strange. So uh, that was a problem because the way I set up the band doc and it wasn't like a Bon Jovi where he's the boss. Everybody had equal say. Everybody, if I made a dollar, he made a dollar, he made a dollar, he made a dollar. But it was kind of a mistake, you know, because there was nobody running the ship. And it was three of them against me. And that's the way it went, you know, because by then they were just went down the rabbit hole and the cocaine and the drinking and, yeah. and I didn't do drugs. So the kind of, I was the odd man out and that really affected our career to the end. Even monsters of rock, we broke up on the last show. And I remember being on stage and the cameras would swing around to George doing a solo. No George. We're talking about giants. Where's George at? He's standing behind his amplifiers playing and the roadie's holding a straw while he snorts Coke. And I thought, oh, shit, man, this is not good. And yeah. that's why I decided to end it, you know? Yeah. So this new awesome. record, where would you personally put it in the dock and, uh, in, you know, out of all the catalogs, where, where do you Ooh, feel like it's boy, good question where do there, you, Giles. Where do you, where do you feel like? Where are we going to put it, Don? Where are we going to put it? <laughs> I honestly, I mean, every musician has a new record and they say, it's the greatest, it's our best. It's amazing. You know, I wouldn't say that, but look, we've got lightning in a bottle. This record, Heaven Comes Down, I'd say is, is as good as any docking record we did in the 80s. You've heard the record. Yeah. 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 I went out of my way that I didn't want any B songs, what I call filler. You know, a lot of these bands, you know, you write the hit, maybe two, and the rest, you buy the record, and they're, you, you guys have must have gone through that. And the rest of the rock record's like, eh, it's all right. Yeah. You, know, you got those that's like, that's like, that's, that's like That's like most records now. Like I said, this is so refreshing to hear, as I said earlier. It's like, an, and I'm not just saying this, it's like an album of hit singles, but they're all new. Yeah. And I agree. They're all hit singles. Will we get hit singles? Probably not. The world's changed. You know, uh, you know, the problem is now you put a record out, you know, on Monday and then somebody puts it up on the Internet and everybody downloads it for free. So you can't make any money. Thank God we made money and we don't care about the money. We, we tour now because we love playing. You know, in the 80s, we wanted a mansion and a Ferrari. and We wanted to be millionaires. And that kind of drove some of the members. I honestly lived in a very modest house down by the beach. I just wanted to make music, man. And when I won that award, you know, uh, when you guys were there, when I got super drunk <laughs> and you guys had to help me get into my room because people kept buying me drink drinks all day. And my daughter was there and she goes, dad, you better eat something. You look like you're getting really wasted. And I went, <laughs> yeah, I think it's kicking in. And so uh, when I got that lifetime achievement award and I just, it's so nice now, this record. I, I've been, we delivered this record one year ago. Wow. I'm chomping at, wow. One year ago, boss. Dude, <laughs> I'm like, I'm chomping at the bit. You know, I want to play these songs live. They won't let us. They don't even want to talk about us till now. <clears throat> and I'm saying, because they're worried about iPhones and they hold them up. We play a new song like Fugitive or Gypsy. Right. And, it out, and it'll be on the internet the next day. Sounds like crap, you know, on an iPhone, but they said, don't play any of the new material. And we're like, come on, man, let's go. We got great <laughs> songs on this record, but they're saying, you got to wait, you got to wait, you got to wait. It's well, driving it's, me crazy. It's definitely worth the wait. Let's put it that way. So so tell me about your live plans. We talked about the new record. What do you plan on doing in terms of performances, live, or are you doing this George Lynch docking thing? Is that continuing? That's done. Uh, yeah. We did it for a year. Uh, Don Doc and George Lynch reunion, but that it kind of got out of control. He was supposed to just come on stage and play two songs. And then he put Lynch Mob back together and they're opening for us. So now he's opening for us and he's playing two songs at the end of the show. So now he has been launched from playing bars back into playing for thousands of people with Dawkin. So that helped him out because mm -hmm. you know, I don't think his career was doing great. Uh, I, we we talk. He lives in New Mexico now too. He lives in Taos. I live in Santa Fe. And I and he texted me a, two months ago and said, "I've done six records this year." 
six, you did six records in one year. And it takes me years to make one. And he said, hey, man, it's just about the money now, about make the money, do a cheap video. And I it's said, little, it's I a little, it's a little, little hard to keep up when someone's putting out four or four to six records a year. I, I see a lot of guys doing that and nothing against anybody. God bless you. Do what you want to do. But as a fan, when someone I like is, you know, I can't keep up with how many records yeah. are on, how many projects and how many bands, you kind of just lose interest in all of it. Because there isn't any one thing to focus on. You're just kind of like, I'm over here, then here, there's another thing. Oh, and he's on someone else's record. Oh, and there's another super group. Super group. Yep. You know, it's and tough I to agree, you know. Stuff. I mean, I saw his videos. He's got Doug Pinnock on one record. Yeah, Michael Sweet on another record. Oni on a record. I'm like, Jesus Christ. You know, so it's as a fan, and I would lose interest too. But he said it's not about perpetuating his career or his legend as a guitar hero. It's just about money. But now you don't get a million dollars for a record or a hundred, two hundred thousand. So it's like, well, if I do six records and they give me 20 grand a record, then I made a couple hundred grand. That's that's his thinking, I think. Yeah. And Jeff Pilson only lives, you know, like two blocks from George in his L.A. house. And Jeff has a studio. So he goes over to Joe. Jeff's great at recording in Pro Tool. He became an expert. So he just goes over and writes riffs and just cranks them out. He's not a songwriter, so he just sends the songs to all these people and they write the lyrics and he puts out these records. I can't do that. You know, nobody's going to write my lyrics and nobody's going to arrange my song. You know, that's not satisfying to me. I but. think the anticipation is gone, right? And I think that's what you're kind of getting to. Like if you wait, even you couldn't even wait to bring out your record. You just want to show your music to the world. And that's anticipation for you, right? That part yep. of the music industry is gone. It's finished. It's just, uh, it's a world of gimme, gimme, gimme now. Well, it, right? is, it is when people are putting out six records a year. I mean, you don't have time to anticipate anything. And, you know, I, you know, on YouTube now seems to be the vehicle. You put out a cheap video and people click on it. Oh, new docking song or a new this band or this band. And they watch it for a minute and they just go on to the next video. Yeah. You know, no, no, you know, the world's changed. I, People have no attention span anymore. That's right. No. Yeah, that's right. So that's, that's when right. we did the video for Heaven Comes Down and my record company, no offense to them, but they gave me like a tiny little budget. And I said, I want to make a great video. It's my last record. My hand's paralyzed. I can't play guitar anymore. I ship my piano to my daughter. It's over. And I said, but it's got to be a great video that people are interested in. And the money they gave me, I said, so you want me to film this video on iPhones, okay? <laughs> you know, I did. I, I said, we want to film it on freaking iPhone? Yeah, man, we do it all the time. I said, I'm not doing that. People so, make movies. People make movies on iPhones now. You can do amazing things with iPhone now. Oh, the new ones with the three cameras? Yeah, and yeah that's crazy. You could make like... Here's my, make, here's my studio right here. You know that? You know that no, but Don, that, I know what you're getting to. You're not going to do it on phone. the iPhone. I got that. Remember that that movie V, or that miniseries yep. V. The, the, the guy that made that, he said that iPhones are so good now they're better than what what we used to make V well, three years ago. Th this years phone ago. has more power than the computers they used to put the first man on the moon. Right. That, Correct. That's what they also say. And you know, back in the eighties, we were using film. That's right. Yeah. It was different. It's it. different. We had to get it developed, and we had to edit it, and you know, no special effects. Now you have AI. You can you look at the new Queensryche video, it's all AI, it's crazy animation, it's amazing. But I said, nope, uh-uh. I'm gonna do something different. It'd be very simple for us to just rent a stage, go on stage, lip sync, make a video, three cameras, done. Nope, not gonna do it. I just happen to be lucky enough that the venue Meow Wolf, which is an art installation, is in Santa Fe. And I negotiated we could film there on their when they're closed on Tuesday. So we filmed uh, Fugitive, and it's a very cool, interesting video. It is. It is. Which it's I think we made our point. It's over a half a million hits. Yeah. It's yeah. only been out six weeks, and now our new video came out, Gypsy, and I said, okay, we did that, and we only got, we only got away with that video because I had people that are famous directors, editors, directors of photography that were fans of Doc, and they said, Don, we'll fly to Santa Fe and 
We'll do it for free. Wow. We just want to, we just want to make a great video. Tom Strickfad and drug all his 5k cameras. He does football. Now these are movie cameras. That's why it looks so amazing. So we did gypsy. I said, let's take a left turn. We had a girl draw that by hand on her iPad. She lives in Poland. I said, well, let's do something different. So Gypsy's very cool. But uh, I was talking to John Levin, who's very good friends with Tommy, who manages Extreme. And he said, you know, Extreme plans on doing a video for every song on their record so they can keep the, the, the album alive for a year. Yeah. And I said, we should do that. Let's make 10 videos, be it animation, AI, film, GoPros, whatever. So we plan on doing that. I'm already oh, working on the next song. Uh, is it me or is it you? We're working on that video right now. Don, as the last question, is this your last Dokken album? I don't know yes. what you're alluding to before. So this is your absolutely your last Don record, Do Dokken record that you're going to make. I feel guilty because I said that after Broken Bones. But yeah, it's that's it. We're we're done. You know, we've made our statement in the rock and roll history. Uh, you know, we'll continue to tour. I mean, my problem now is when we tour is we'd had so many hits and they only want you to play 90 minutes. What songs do we kick out of the set and add to the new record, be it Gypsy or Fugitive or Over the Mountain? What do we kick out? Into the Fire? Breaking the Chains? The Hunter? Alone Again? It's Not Lucky? Just Got Lucky? It's Not Love? What do we get rid of? You know? You only got 90 minutes. It's a really hard it's, call. It's, it's tough. And then there's a whole lot of great music from the late 90s, 2000s that doesn't get played as well. You know, yeah. you could do a four hour show in theory. We could, like, man, you know, <laughs> Metallica plays two and a half hours. But I said, what do we keep? What do we get rid of? But for us, you know, to be fulfilled as musicians, we just we don't want to be foreigner. We don't just want to play all the hits. It's boring. So, on our show now, we do Too High to Fly, which was on Dysfunctional, because that's a vehicle for John to play his solo in the middle of the song. And people look at us and they go, well, what's, they don't know. This. Some people know the song, some people don't. It's my homage to Jim Morrison. But I said, let's yes. just say we want. Let's all sit down and, and say, what do we want to play? What makes us happy to play? And if the fans go, I don't know this song, or I don't know this song, sorry. Yeah. I came to a very revelation two years ago when I got paralyzed that I spent my whole life, my whole career to keep the fans happy, to be on the road for a year and a half, no life. I had a son and a daughter and I didn't even watch them grow up. I'd come home and they sprouted a foot. And I said, you know, I don't have any obligation to the fans to keep going on. I do it because we love to play. But I would like to play songs that are near and dear to my heart. So that's what we're going to do. We're right now on a 10-day break. And I said, everybody, write a set list of all the songs you'd like to play. Chris, BJ, John, tell me what you guys would like to play live, and we'll play it. But we're going to have to ditch, maybe in my dreams, into the fire. You know, we, we got, I mean, we're still playing Breaking the Chains. And that song was written over 40 years ago. The shocking thing is when I see the fans, I see people in their early 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and we play Breaking the Chains. Everybody knows the words, even a 22-year-old. I'm like, you weren't, born. you weren't born when I wrote that song. But Thank we you. still play Breaking the Chains, even though it wasn't a big hit. Uh, you know, it wasn't, but they, but they found the song like a treasure, you know, when they got older. And I talk to these people and they say, well, you know, my parents got married, they got a job, they bought a house, and they weren't going to rock concerts anymore and smoking pot. So they took all their records and CDs and gave it to their kids. And their kids got turned on the docking, but they were only 12 or 13, they couldn't come see us. And by the time they were old enough to come see us, we broke up. So now right. they're like, finally, I get to see docking live. And now I'm 24, five, you know, that's pretty cool. I think it's pretty cool. You know what? It's very admirable what you're doing, you know, and, and, and all the power to you. The album's coming out October 27th on Silver Lining Music. Heaven Comes Down. 
Another classic Dawkin album, I will say. Uh, absolutely. Another yeah. classic Dawkin album. And you know what? If it's the last one, what a hell of a way to go out. There you go. Yep. But if you but if you change your mind, that's cool. <laughs> that, 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 that's cool as well. We <laughs> won't hold it against you. How's that? We won't that's hold funny. it against you. Yeah, I said that. I'm I, Maybe I'm speaking too soon. I was at the airport with John. We landed in Dallas before I left. I said, John, you want to do another record? And he says, I don't know if I have it in me. And I said, well, let's just work on Heaven Comes Down. We'll talk in a year about. John goes, I have eight songs I've written. And I still have four or five songs that are finished. So much for that. <laughs> you, know, you know what's going to happen? You know, like, never you say know, never. Murphy's Law is going to happen. You're going to, this is going to come out and be a hit. And then you're going to have to do another record. Yep. I'm going to be apologizing to both of you saying, <laughs> I'm sorry I said this is our last record. And now we have another one. I apologize. And that one's going to be the last record. It's okay. It's all right. That'll be the last record. That'll right? be the it's like the Rolling Stones are in their 80s now, and they're still making records, you know, and they keep saying, oh, good. Kiss. He, yeah. Gene says, you know, we're not making any more records because they don't have to. They had so many hits, but they're yeah. still touring. And every year it's our final tour. It's our farewell tour. We're over, but they keep going out. But yep. I don't, I don't honestly, me, think I'll be doing that. I think I've devoted my life to my fans and people like you, and I've given 40 years, and now I just turned 70 and at the end of June, and I think it's time that I've left L.A. now, and I'm now in New Mexico in this beautiful chateau with a mountain. I own the whole damn mountain because I didn't want anybody building behind me, and I just want to enjoy my life, and, you know, what gives me happiness is now walking my three shepherds every day up the trails and hiking, and what I do late at night is uh, you know, I have Alexa and I'll have a memory of a song when I was 14 and I'll go, Alexa, play Incense and Peppermints from the Music Machine you know, when I was you know 10 and they'll, she'll play it. Play me some yeah. Beatles, play me some Stones, play Sympathy for the Devil. It's kind of like I'm reminiscing about everything I grew up with and that's kind of my happy space at night. What a great way to end the interview. Thank you so much, Don. You're welcome, uh, boss. Hope to interview again, you again, on your next album or your next tour. But if <laughs> not, it's all good, buddy. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> well, just tell your fans you've heard the record. We have been very, very on the DL on this record. Yep. I mean, they wouldn't let us play any songs live. You've heard the record. It's a great record. And now it really is. that. All right. Have yourself a wonderful day. Thanks a lot.